Thank you. Okay, super important question. How many of y'all have ever seen a movie called Desperately Seeking Susan? Okay, that's about like half of you. Okay, quick, quick. If you've never seen this movie, you should see this movie. Um, quick, quick refresher on the plot for those who have seen it, and for those who haven't, I'll just give you the quick synopsis. Um, most pe so the movie from 1985, starring Susan Sottleman. Most people think this movie was starring Madonna. It was not starring Madonna, it was starring Rosanna Arquette. It was featuring Madonna, right? And so what this movie is about is it's about a couple who communicate in a long-distance relationship by leaving advertisements for one another in the back page of the Village Voice, and about a woman who sort of observes and recognizes what's going on and sort of semi-inadvertently injects herself into their relationship through a series of comic mistaken identities and shenanigans ensuing and whatever. The current version of Desperately Seeking Susan, so the current version of like the back page of the Village Voice ads is the missed connections feed on Craigslist. Do you all know what that is? Right, okay, so this is, you have a romantic encounter with someone and you screw it up. Um, you don't get their phone number, you don't get their name, you don't have any way to talk to them, right? And so the Hail Mary pass is you leave an ad right in the misconnections and you say, you were on the F train, you were wearing blue, I couldn't keep my eyes off you, please write me, right? So I have a theory uh, that um, people regularly have second order missed connections, which is to say, you have an encounter with someone who you um, are attracted to, you leave an ad, they agree, they leave an ad, and then you forget to check. You can see how this could happen, right? Um, we're all very busy in New York. So at night, while I sleep, I run this program on my computer. It's very bright. I can't really see it. I don't know if you can see it. But, um, but, uh, and what it does is it downloads all the misconnections feeds in your city, um, runs them against one another randomly, and looks at the words that are in common and estimates the percentage chance that these two people are talking about each other. Right? Um, so words like the and of and from don't really matter, but like a proper noun would matter or an adjective or a place. So these have a 7% chance, so they're not talking about one another. If it goes above 85%, it puts them in touch. It emails them and says, you two need to meet. Um, and this is what I do while I sleep. Um, right? It's kind of, you know, whatever. It's a public service. So I make, um, so this is what I do. Um, I make art. Uh, but I make art using um, technology, just like Lauren. Um, I'm interested in looking at ways in which technology is used in society and looking at ways to critique it as a form of portraiture. Um, and so when we think about portraits, we usually think, oh, I also, um, who was it? What was it? Winston Churchill, right? Said power corrupts, right? So been absolute power corrupts absolutely. So PowerPoint corrupts pointlessly, right? So I don't use PowerPoint. I just open shit on my computer because that's why we have a fucking operating system. Um, so um, right. So when we think about portraits, right? We often think about you know oil paintings of dead men ideally on horseback. This one is not on horseback, but this is Charles, you know, this is, this is Gilbert Stewart's um, portrait of George Washington. This is the famous Lansdowne portrait. This is the canonic portrait of the founding of the United States, right? This was a gift to the Marquess of Lansdowne who negotiated the treaty that ended the Revolutionary War. This is an oil painting. Um, there's a lot of symbolism in the painting. You can see a rainbow in the upper right. Nobody ever notices a rainbow at first. It's really weird. It's like super cheesy, right? Um, He's got a sword, it's in his left hand though, which means he's a man of peace and there's a quill on the desk, right? So this is usually what you think of when you think about portraits. I think about them in a little bit of a different way. Um, as Stefan said, I'm a musician, so like, here's an example. Good one. Let's try it. Uh, this is a good one, okay. So here's an example of this. Um, I was asked once to do a soundtrack for a film about Star Wars, okay, um, by a very crazy guy um, who was going to do a director commentary to the entire film, but he was not the director of the film. He was an artist who was really obsessed with the film, and he had a conspiracy theory 
And his conspiracy theory was the following. What if Star Wars, right? Star Wars, like the movie Star Wars, right? Star Wars A New Hope, 1977, George Lucas. What if Star Wars, instead of being this kind of bottom-feeding pop culture phenomenon that's like everything from Man in a Thousand Faces run through a film school machine and put out. What if instead of that, it was a really smart intertextual critique of post-war modernism in the Nixon administration? So, which is to say that any time you talk about the lightsaber, you talk about the sculptures of Dan Flavin, who worked with fluorescent lights. And any time you talk about the Death Star, you talk about the Pruitt Igo public housing in St. Louis. Right? And Luke Skywalker is really Robert Smithson. Right? And so he asked me to do the soundtrack. And he, and he asked me to do something that looks at like the inherent modernism in the music. And so what I did was, um, this is a machine learning thing. Um, so what I did was I took all the, all the music from Star Wars, all the John Williams music from Star Wars, fed it into the computer. And then I took all the 1970s keyboard, keyboard music from a guy named Philip Glass, fed it into the computer and told the computer to breed them so that you have the harmonies and melodies of Star Wars in the rhythm and keyboard performance practice of Philip Glass. And I created my own conspiracy because both of those men went to Juilliard together. And so what if they collaborated? What if they made a record together that we never heard? Right? That sounds kind of like Star Wars. And sort of reminds you of Star Wars, but it isn't quite right. Right? Um, it sort of sounds like Steve Reich, actually. This is what happens when you do that. Anyway, so I do things like this. Um, so let me show you a couple other things. So a lot of the things that I do involve media, so music, text, sound, image. Um, a good example of this would be uh, I have a bunch of films. Um, a lot of the films I do are about um, accelerating media. So this would be a fun... Example, this is a project I did 10 years ago for the Sundance Film Festival. Um, this is a commission. This is every Academy Award Best Picture, um, sped up to one minute each. This is an unwatchable movie, right? So it's 75 movies in 75 minutes, right? So every film, is, so the entire film is in here, right? It's not, um, it's not skipping through the film, it's averaging the film, right? Um, if we fast forward to a movie you might recognize, that was Gone with the Wind, that was Casablanca. Um, okay, there you go. So, this is Casablanca. Every movie's one minute, so it's being sped up, you know, depending on the length of the film, it's being sped up different amounts. Right, so this is Casablanca. Um, and you recognize it as Casablanca, right? Right, like, so Rick still looks like Rick, Ilsa still looks like Ilsa, Paris still looks like Paris. Right? You get the idea. If you fast forward to a more modern film, like this is going to be Chicago. Chicago is a little harder to read. And there's a good reason for that. Um, they're both the same length movie. They're about an hour and a half, so they're being sped up the same amount. The reason they're harder to read is the average length of a cinematic shot in the 1940s was about 26 seconds. And now it's about six seconds, right? So, it, so the so the editing technology is belied in the technique of acceleration, and, give, and it shows this kind of cultural ADD, right? So, what I'm trying to do is trying to work with the media to show you something you wouldn't normally see. Um, that's a piece using you know kind of found footage. A piece that does something similar with you know real life footage would be something like this. This is also about ten years ago. Um, about ten years ago this summer. My partner and I took over a traffic island um, on Union Square. You know that thing where like Park Avenue South splits and you get Broadway and Fourth Avenue and there's like a little, a little tra traffic island there off of Union Square? So we took that thing over for four days. Um, Fourth of July weekend 2007 and set up a boudoir, as one does. And, um, and we spent 72 hours making a continuous film. And this is a performance piece, and so what you're watching is the documentation of the performance piece. So what Leon did was she spent 72 hours doing 72 minutes of action, which is to say she got ready for a date in slow motion. Right? Then I filmed everything with a four camera, high def, continuous film shoot, so you don't see them, but there's a 60 person film crew up there. Um, and then we sped the whole thing up. 
So everything that she did in the performance that took an hour takes a minute in the film. Everything that took a minute takes a second in the film. Does that make sense? And we did it in full public view as a living diorama performance piece. So uh, people could just walk by and unless they stood still long enough, they disappear. There's all these things that mark time, like heartbeats, right? So like the, the traffic lights um, are a heartbeat, right? And she does her thing, right? She writes in a diary. She has some food. Uh, anything she can't do slowly, she'll do repetitively. So when she smokes, she'll smoke 20 cigarettes in a row to take up all the time. Um, right? The sun comes up. The sun goes down. Right? She talks on the phone. Um, the sun comes up. She tries on some dresses. The sun goes down. Right? It takes her 16 hours to pick out her dresses. It takes her six hours to do her nails on one hand. Um, and then eventually... She puts on this like seven year itch number and walks off stage and hails a taxi, right? Um, and this is an unwatchable performance, right? Nobody saw this whole thing except me and my director of photography, this guy named Toshi Ozawa. Everybody else sort of dropped in and out, but if you speed it up, you get a different piece that tells you a different story about a different set of things. Um, and so I'm sort of interested in that like duality of like working with media in that way. Um, some of the things I do have more to do with words. So this is the thing, mm, if you've seen anything about me, you've probably seen this. Um, so in 2008, I got asked by the Democratic Party of the United States to make a piece for their convention which was in Denver um, at the time, as part of a big citywide art show called Dialogue City. The Democratic Party has an art curator. I don't know if you knew that. It's a fun fact. You might think about that for a minute and think whether that makes sense or not, but you know. Um, and, and, and this person asked me to do something with words, something with words, which is a really frustrating prompt to get from a curator. Um, and so I found this place called the American Presidency Project, which some of you probably know about, right? It's a digital humanities art archive out of UC Santa Barbara, where they have everything every president ever wrote or said online. And you can sort of go in there and find out how many times Taft said donut or whatever, right? Um, and so I rolled up in the piece, I showed up there and I was like, I'm your first artist in residence. And they were like, we have no idea what you're talking about, sit down. Um, and what I did was, um, I got really stuck, actually. I got really stuck, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I was like, well, I'm gonna make like a Billboard Hot 100 of things presidents say all the time, like I'm not a crook, or whatever. Um, and, and I got stuck and I was watching, y'all remember this show Crossfire on CNN? Remember the show, it's sort of like, bunch of people yelling at one another, and once in a while there's a guest, right? So one of the people doing the yelling is James Carville, right? And, you know, Bill Clinton's domestic policy advisor. And he was on a rant about George W. Bush, who was president at the time, and the word he kept using was vision. He kept saying, the problem with him is he doesn't have vision, 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 vision. So the way you test someone's vision traditionally is you make an eye chart. So these are eye charts. Um, this is George Washington's eye chart. So what you're seeing is the 66 words in his State of the Union addresses that he uses more than any other president. Um, George W. Bush, who was president at the time I made this piece, his number one word was terror, right? And the way you get from gentleman to terror in 43 easy steps, right, is, a, is an alternative portraiture of American history, right? And if you want, you can go see these. These are at the National Portrait Gallery in situ against the oil paintings of the presidents who they represent, right, right now. So, um, so you know, Bill Clinton spent a lot of his presidency talking about the century in which he would no longer be president, right? Um, Ronald Reagan talked about deficits. Richard Nixon, um, you know, his number one word was truly. Which makes sense, right? Richard Nixon's speechwriter was an amateur linguist, or one of his speechwriters was an amateur linguist, a guy named William Sapphire, right? Had a column in the New York Times called On Language for years and years and years, so he counted words, right? He knew his boss had a credibility gap, so he rigged the discourse, right? Which is the kind of thing you would do now, and he didn't need a computer to do it. He did it with three by five index cards, right? Lyndon Johnson was the first president to give his speeches on primetime television. So his speechwriters had him begin, at, begin every paragraph with the word tonight. Otherwise, it would have been Vietnam, right? And what it looks like is these big, crazy eye charts as light boxes. They're to scale. So if you stand 20 feet back and you can read between those two black lines, you have 20-20 vision. It's important to do things that are useful. Um, and that's what they look like, right? And this is sort of a history lesson, but it's also a portrait. And it's also a thing about kind of data. 
and it's an interesting data set, but it's not a particularly democratic one. So the sequel to it, which I did in 2010, was around trying to find a group or a corpus of data of ordinary Americans describing themselves. And so what I stumbled across was online dating. And so in 2010, the summer of 2010, I joined 21 different online dating services. Um, in every zip code in America, uh, as a straight man, a gay man, a straight woman, a gay woman, uh, and I downloaded um, 19 million people's dating profiles. So about 20% of the adult single population in the United States to a hard drive. And I made maps. This is a cartography project. This is where all the funny people are. Right, Nebraska is not funny. Um, this is where all the lonely people are. Lonely people tend to be in Appalachia. Um, folks who are shy tend to congregate in the upper Midwest. Right? I'm changing how I, you would talk about these people to be deliberately incorrect, right? Um, and then this is a kinky map. So what this is telling you is that the women in West Virginia need to hang out with the men in southern New Mexico and have a good time, right? Um, and then what you do is you do the same trick, right, with the eye charts, which is called a TFIDF. It's kind of an easy statistical trick to do with words. But you do it spatially instead of temporally. So what I do is I replace the name of every city in the United States with the word people use more in that city than anywhere else in the country in their dating services. So if you have ever dated anyone from Seattle, this makes perfect sense. <laughs> right? This is like this is this is like this is like Laura Tatum who I dated in 1994. This is her fucking eye chart, right? So it's like heartbreak and pretty, right? Like she was in a band Right, she smoked, like whatever, you know? So like, this is email, this is Redmond, Washington, which is the headquarters of Microsoft, because they don't have anything better to talk about. Um, and so this is um, cool. Some of these you can guess, right? So like Los Angeles is acting, right? Because of course it fucking is, right? And you go up and you know, San Francisco's gay. Um, if you get down to the zip code level, things get really creepy really fast. Right, so this is the downtown Los Angeles. Um, you know, what are some other good ones? Some of them are kind of, you know, well, some of them are like really funny, like Madison, Wisconsin's number one word is pierced. Good college town, right, number one. Um, you know, some of them are a little bit more heartbreaking, right? Like, so folks in um, Baton Rouge will say curvy. Folks in Louisiana will talk about the flood, right? People down in New Orleans, right? So. Um, Let's see, what's another good one? Folks in Washington, D.C. Let's find that. Yeah, there you go. Folks in our nation's capital will say they're interesting because they're not. <laughs> um, and folks in Baltimore will say they're afraid because they are, right? So that's kind of how that works. Um, I grew up somewhere between annoying and cynical in New Jersey, which makes sense. Uh, that's about right. Um, New York City's number one word overall, we'll get to dinosaur in a minute. Um, New York City's number one word um, overall is now. Right? Which is, you know, which makes sense, right? Because you, you often will use the phrase, right? Like, now I'm working as a waiter, but actually I'm an actor. Right? You see how that would work? Um, right? And then you go upstairs, you know, and dinosaur. Anybody you know why this is? If you're from Syracuse, you're immediately going to know why this is. Okay. The only good place to eat in Syracuse, New York, is a Hells Angels barbecue joint called Dinosaur Barbecue. Right? They have one in Harlem, right? Um, right? There's, that's actually not true. There's two good places to eat in Syracuse, New York. The other one's called Alto Cinco, but this is the good one. So this is where you would take somebody on a date, right? You have to remember where this came from. Right, so like the same thing with Lincoln, Nebraska. Lincoln, Nebraska's number one word is Osaka, which is the hip, trendy downtown sushi joint. Um, I am, where do I live? I live somewhere between unconditional and midsummer, I think, in Midtown. Let's look. Um, and then I'll show you a couple last things. Yeah, so like I live somewhere around here, right? Um, gentrified Williamsburg is kind of like this, right? We got like DJ glamorous, urbane, hipsters, narcissistic. You get the idea. And what I was trying to do was I was trying to make an alternative census. So I made this in 2010, I made this a while ago. And so I wasn't, so this is like, you know, I wasn't thinking about Edward Snowden, nobody knew who that guy was yet, right? I was thinking about the census and how if I could make something as equally flawed and arbitrary as the US census, it would like sort of lead to this, you know, kind of discussion. I also make self-portraits. This is my self-portrait. Um, this is a quantified selfie. 
And so this is every email I've ever sent. Um, in something called a force directed graph, which is super trendy in data visualization because you can be lazy and you don't have to label the axes. Um, but the basic idea is there's a, um, there's a you know, kind of big bang in the middle, everybody goes flying out. Everybody's got gravity. And the heuristic is, you know, people have gravity based on how long they've been emailing each other, how much they've been emailing each other. And it also does sentimental analysis. So if I say I love you, you're heavier to me, right? And so this is everybody I've ever spoken to. And the closer in, the more I'm connected to them. And they're all handwritten, right? So it's a big, like, five-foot square canvas. Don't try this at home. This is a real drag to do. Um, but this is everybody I've ever talked to. Um, and, you know, it sort of works. So, like, uh, up in the corners are all the people I don't know very well. So somewhere, you know, in the sort of, like, northeast quadrant are all the kind of, like, nameless apparatchiks that a college professor has carbon copied on and, like, emails of people you never meet. You know, like, chiefs of staff and secretaries and stuff like that down at the bottom or you know, people I knew in college, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These things aren't always super funny. So like a more kind of, um, a more kind of fraught thing would be this. This is a project I did two years ago that's been touring ever since. Um, so uh, this is a Walter PPK 9mm semi-automatic handgun that was used in a shooting in the French Quarter in New Orleans a couple years ago. Um, on Valentine's Day in an argument over parking in front of my house. So um, two people killed each other dead from their automobiles arguing over this parking space. Uh, the NOPD, um, in their beautifully laconic way, um, refer to this as a zero-sum crime. Um, and so they gave me the gun to do a project with. Um, this is some barbecue I ate. Uh, this is, the, um, uh, this is the, the hardware store I went to 50 times to find the hard-to-find drawer. I was like... What if the hard to find drawer is also hard to find? <laughs> but anyway, um, this is an Internet of Things piece, right? The Internet of Things is one of these like bizarre terms because usually there's no internet and there's no thing. But in this case, there's both. Um, so this is like a little bike chain thing. This is me doing engineering. It's kind of tragic. But um, it's a bike chain in a, in a little Raspberry Pi. So what you do is you take the gun, you drill a little hole in it. <laughs> you build this crazy contraption. That's my buddy Cole. Help me weld, um, right? You uh, you take the gun, you weld it down to this big steel plate. You go home at night. You get attacked by a rooster the next morning. You take the whole thing and you stick this whole whatever in a box underneath the hoopy doopy and run a little wire through to the trigger of the gun. Then you stick it in a fancy art gallery and you put the the inner the computer in there on the internet. Um, and you have it listen to the 911 feed of the New Orleans Police Department so that um, anytime there's a shooting reported in New Orleans, it fires. Right. right? You all know what this okay. is. This is called data visualization. A bunch of you probably do this for a living. Right? Data visualization sucks. And this is a piece about why data visualization sucks. Right? So, um, so if you watch what happened, there's a big flash of light and a big noise. There's no bullet because I'm using blank ammunition but there's still a cartridge right there. Um, New Orleans has five or six shootings a day. So what happens is over the course of the run of this piece, um, the vitrine filled up with bullets, right? And this is to make you face a really heartbreaking fact about data visualization, which is when you start treating people as numbers, you end up um, becoming anesthetized to what those numbers really mean. And so there's this real heartbreaking fact about this piece, which is you come into the gallery, you read the label, you understand what it does, and part of you is still kind of disappointed and ticked off if it doesn't go off while you're there, right? And that's not a good thing. Right, that's actually like a real like problem with how we deal with information in a world where we use bar graphs instead of photographs, right? Um, in sort of common discourse. So this has been touring ever since, and this is the you know the kind of work I do. So um, fun stuff. Anyway, um, but I thought I'd show you some a few things. So thanks for listening. Should we all talk? Yeah. <laughs>